Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online.
Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you. And, and apologize for starting two minutes uh, late. This is now uh, the third time in a row where I've started uh, talking with the guests before we uh, before we go live and, and we end up going off into a, a, a tangent. So apologies for coming on a couple minutes late, uh, but welcome. My name is Jude Blanchett and I'm the Freeman Chair in China Studies here at uh, CSIS. And I'm, I'm really excited this morning for uh, a discussion, a quick discussion of now 27 minutes on the topic of Chinese nationalism. And this is obviously something that has particular salience in, in our, our current news cycle, where we're seeing discussions of wolf warrior diplomats. We're seeing a, a domestic backlash in China against the writer Fang Fang for her recently published Wuhan diary. We're seeing nationalist spats with Thailand. We're seeing rising uh, popular frustration with the Hong Kong protest movement. Not to mention we're seeing this uh, rapidly escalating more of words between the US um, and, and China. And so while we're all aware, we seem to be aware that there's this rising tide of nationalism, a uh, question I want to pose to my guest today is, what do we really understand about nationalism in China? How does it operate? How do we define it? How does it impact policy making in Beijing? And I think moving forward, this is going to be a topic, it's going to be very important that we have an accurate calibration of so that we're not making lazy generalizations about you know, nationalism rising or, or falling, as seems to be the case now. And there is almost literally no one better to explore this topic with than uh, my guest today, uh, Jessica Chun Weiss. Jessica is a uh, associate professor of government at, excuse me, at Cornell University. She's the political science or a political science editor at the Washington Post's fantastic and, and indispensable uh, monkey cage blog. And I think probably her greatest title is she is a non-resident senior associate at the Freeman Chair here at uh, CSIS. Um, I asked Jessica on today because really this topic of nationalism in China and its impact on foreign policy um, in China and, and more broadly um, is really the center of her work. Both her, um, her uh, 2014 book, Powerful Patriots, Nationalist Protest in China's Foreign Relations, which was published by Oxford University Press, and a series of really, really fascinating uh, academic papers that Jessica has done teasing out this topic. Um, I also want to give a shout out to, I don't know if you can see that, maybe not, uh, one of her more recent books, uh, sorry for the background noise there, which is published by OUP. Uh, just recently, this is a co-edited volume called Citizens and the State and Authoritarian Regimes Comparing China and Russia, which has some absolutely fantastic papers for folks who are looking at contemporary political developments in China and, and Russia. Uh, has some really, really interesting uh, research in there. So Jessica, thank you very much uh, for joining us this morning. My pleasure, Jude. Thanks for having me. Um, because of time and because we're trying to keep this a tight conversation, I, I want to just dive right into it. And before we get to some of the more substantive uh, questions on how does nationalism impact China, I actually wanted to start with a level set, which is the, the word nationalism to me seems like the word legitimacy or ideology, where we hear it a lot, but I think it, it's kind of like definitions of God. If you get 10 different people in a room and ask them what it means, we're going to get a wide variety of definitions. So just in your own, either your colloquial use of nationalism, uh, as might appear, for example, in the Monkey Cage blog or, or in your academic work, um, can you help us get a, a more accurate or more calibrated definition of what are we talking about when we talk about nationalism? 
Absolutely. So <clears throat> there is no one definition of nationalism that even academics can agree on. In, in my first book, Powerful Patriots, I use the a definition by Ernst Haas, uh, whereby nationalism is an ideology that makes assertions about the nation's claim to historical uniqueness, <clears throat> to the territory that the nation state ought to occupy, and to the kinds of relations that should prevail between one nation, one's nation and others. And that last piece, I think, really gets at the lay distinction between terms like nationalism and patriotism, where uh, patriotism is about pride in one's own uh, country and one's own nation, and nationalism uh, typically has more negative connotations about how one views one's own country or nation as distinct from and often in most cases superior to uh, another country's uh, people or, or nation. And so patriotism in this balance is often something like civic nationalism. It's more inclusive, less jingoistic. Um, whereas uh, national identity, measures of national identity, uh, particularly as they are asked in survey questions, uh, typically refer to beliefs among citizens that, uh, you know, that their uh, country is superior to others, that they would rather be a citizen of their country rather than another country. Um, and it's often measured in terms of uh, sort of negative stereotypes about other uh, countries or other countries' citizens. So that's kind of a rough and ready, but it's really important when using that term to be very careful about what it's referring to. Um, because, uh, you know, as one of the pieces that I wrote argues that, you know, a focus on nationalism, uh, and, and in particular, the idea that there is rising nationalism, um, really kind of elides this debate over whether it's about the attitudes that uh, citizens in China have about how uh, you know, China's increased, you know, military and economic might should be used on the world stage versus how citizens feel about, you know, China, the country, and, and the CCP, the government. Yeah, it's interesting. You notice that, you know, in Chinese, the, they would talk about Aiguojui, you know, there was a reference to patriotism. And you see that in most countries when they're referring inwardly to their own attitudes, it's obviously, it's a patriotic attitude. And when then we look at other countries, it's usually framed as, as nationalism. And I certainly in the US and I think in China as well, there's exactly. relative disconnect or inability to, to understand external perception uh, on, on some of these attitudes. Um, Building on that that helpful definition or that that foundational definition, um, I wanted to ask you about um, what do we know more broadly about the influence of nationalism or Chinese nationalism on China's leaders? Um, I noticed just in normal discourse and in media discourse, at, at certain moments we talk about popular nationalism as if it's a threat to the regime. And, and you look at the historical legacy of nationalism in China, and you do see that it's often targeted at, at the leadership for a failure, uh, policy failure, perceived failure. But at other times, um, it, it seems as if nationalism is described as kind of a cohering force um, that's rallying behind Beijing. And, and we're certainly hearing that more recently. Um, I found in, in one of your recent papers, it reminded me of this great quote of Xi Jinping from 2013, where he says, winning or losing public support is an issue that concerns the CCP's survival or extinction. Now, I guess public support is, is different or distinct from nationalism, but nonetheless seem to be saying that we really have to care about popular attitudes for our own, our own legitimacy. So I, I wonder if at a, a, a broader level, if you can talk to me about how should we think about uh, nationalism as a, as a threat or as a, as, a, um, as a sort of an ally of the regime? Yeah, you really put a finger on the dilemma that the Chinese Communist Party faces in trying to harness nationalism, because it is uh, one of the pillars of the Chinese Communist Party's legitimacy. It's how they justify their continued single party rule. But it's also only, first, it's only one of a number of different ways in which they legitimate their rule. And secondly, it's not the you know, not necessarily reflexively a pillar of support for the regime. So if the government doesn't perform well in, you know, advancing, the, isn't seen as performing well in advancing the Chinese nation's interest, it can then blow back uh, against the government. And so the, I see nationalism not as a direct driver of Chinese foreign policy, but something that the government needs to manage carefully. Um, in particular, I think it's important uh, to note that the Chinese government has been very strategic in allowing or suppressing nationalist mobilization, whether that's in the street in the form of nationalist protests uh, or online and on social media, um, that when 
the government gives a longer leash to uh, grassroots as well as you know state affiliated nationalist voices. It's a often a signal that the government plans to take a much you know tougher stance. But sometimes when the government at the end of this cycle feels that it has you know made its point, it's gone far enough. Uh, that it's time to you know, tamp down the risk of, of international and domestic escalation, that's when the government has been willing to you know, pay the costs of reining in these angry voices, even though it comes often at a cost of, of disenchantment with, with the government's very heavy-handed uh, manipulation of these uh, sentiments. Can you just unpack that last point, which I, I think is pretty interesting on, on cost. Um, Dan, I think it's widely perceived that, especially under Xi Jinping's China, the, the state has more or less total control or significant amount of control to shape, guide public opinion. But you seem to be just be talking about trade-offs or, or costs mm -hmm. that in, in tamping down uh, nationalist mobilization, whether, you know, as you described in, in, your, in your 2014 book and the, you know, in 2012 with a lot of the protests surrounding the Sunkaku Islands, um, can you talk a little bit more about wh what is that cost that Beijing pays? Is this kind of an incohate, vague cost to legitimacy, or do you see something actually more explicit in terms of what Beijing gives up when it when it tamps down on protests? So it is uh, a sort of a often difficult to discern cost because by definition, once you've repressed it, it's not visibly mobilized. It's no longer in the streets or raging online. I mean, it is literally the in you know, the contemporary era, it is the social media accounts on, on WeChat that have been deleted. Um, it's those who have been disappeared, et cetera. Mostly they don't disappear the nationalists, but nonetheless, um, you know, those that full suite of um, coercive options are available. Um, but you can still nonetheless, I think, discern it in the kind of disgruntled comments uh, that you know, the sidelong kind of efforts to resist or continue to perpetrate those those narratives. Um, it's also, you know, in the work that I did for my first book, it's, a, you know, apparent when you are, you know, able to talk with individuals, you know, privately about their experiences, um, feeling like they were kind of uh, utilized by the, the, the Chinese Communist Party, uh, only to then, you know, you know, meet the heavy hand of, of the government's uh, subsequent crackdown. And, and some of those individuals, I don't want to generalize, you know, too broadly, but some of those individuals sort of ceased to be nationalists and became much more liberal um, because they felt so, you know, disenchanted with the government's crackdown. So on the margins, they definitely do pay a cost. And I think that, uh, you know, it varies depending on whether, you know, the size of the mobilization, whether it's in the streets or simply online. Uh, and of course, crack down, cracking down on um, you know physical protests is is quite risky, as the government you know uh, you know has witnessed in in past where this kind of repression backfires. Do we see just incidentally? Do we see today um, in terms of of quantity and quality? Do we see the same types of protests that that we saw in 2012? And are those are those conceivable now that you would see folks out on the street with? Um, you know, with with patriotic banners, um, like we seem to see both in neo neo Maoists, which I looked at, or some of these uh, some of these nationalists, which you looked at, which often overlap. So it's hard for me to understand what the bounds of permissible civic mm -hmm. action are in in 2020 versus 10 years ago or the pre Xi era. Yeah, it, there's a big uh, a disjuncture between the pre Xi era and today's China. Today, under Xi, we haven't seen much permission given to large scale. Uh, nationalist protests. The last large-scale wave of anti-foreign demonstrations was in 2012 over the disputed islands in the East China Sea. And despite plenty of occasions in which Chinese nationalists were outraged, uh, the government has always stopped short of allowing or uh, encouraging them to take to the streets. So increasingly, we're seeing a much more state-directed, uh, you know, wave of of nationalism and and nationalist coercion, including. Uh, you know, the use of apparently consumer-backed boycotts, but uh, also, you know, state-directed. Um, you know, last fall with the NBA controversy, I thought it was, it was worth pointing out that, you know, as soon as somebody tried to, you know, unfurl banners in front of one of those NBA uh, games in China, you know, security uh, authorities quickly escorted mm. that uh, individual away. So 
Uh, again, there's always the possibility of it, but so far, uh, you know, Xi Jinping's leadership has decided that the, you know, the benefits are not worth the risks. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask about, uh, again, this idea of nationalism rising or falling and, and kind of as an ac academic looking at this, how do, how do we measure this? Um, in the post-2008 global financial crisis period, there was this discussion of a more, quote, aggressive China. Um, we seemed, again, the work that you were doing um, uh, for Powerful Patriots, we seemed to feel like we we're in this moment of, quote, rising nationalism. And, and I suppose from a conceptual level, but also from a practical practitioner level working on this, how do we, do, how do we measure rises and falls in, in nationalism? I mean, I have an, a gut sense that at certain periods it, it quote unquote feels like nationalism is rising, but I realize that's not a particularly good standpoint from which to make uh, assertions about public opinion. H mm -hmm. How does one actually do this? So looking at public opinion, it's very important, I think, to construct and use, you know, consistent measures over time. And this is where I was beginning to mention at the outset of our conversation, how important it is to look at the difference between uh, feelings of national identification and attitudes about willingness to use force. And so in the surveys that I've conducted or used, um, you know, built on a, a wider range, array of surveys, uh, what I've found is that <clears throat> there is... Uh, amongst a younger generation of Chinese, a greater uh, willingness to uh, invest in and potentially use military force, um, and that the younger generation is much more opinionated uh, than older generations, much less likely to say that they you know, don't know or uh, unwilling to answer uh, on these surveys. This is both online and offline uh, surveys. And, and then amongst a smaller set of elites uh, that were reached in a survey sample. Similarly, you saw uh, more uh, willingness to express an opinion and also more willingness to uh, rely on military strength. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also important to juxtapose those findings with other surveys that also show uh, you know, significant uh, strands of um, you know, pacifism and uh, you know, in accordance with the Chinese uh, rhetoric and about you know, China being a peace-loving nation, uh, as well as, well as um, you know, a decreased willingness to use force when other considerations, other domestic concerns are on the table. And so it's important not to take any of these uh, sort of in isolation um, because the, you know, and this is consistent with the idea that the Chinese government really straddles an incredibly diverse array of domestic uh, views and opinions. And so these different strands of um, beliefs amongst the public and amongst uh, elites give the Chinese government uh, considerable room for maneuver. It means that there are always trade-offs uh, whenever they are sort of navigating this uh, shifting domestic and international context. Yeah, it strikes me one of the unfortunate things about the moment we're in now with, with increasing scrutiny, and I think rightfully so, of China's behavior is, um, I think, a confusion of the increasing difficulty of measuring public opinion for the idea that there is no public opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I oftentimes find myself in disputes with people about the fact that just because the CCP is able to exert such significant control over the public sphere doesn't mean there isn't a, a, a public sphere. It's harder for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think increasingly the work that you're doing, and, and I just want to shout out to the, the Journal of Contemporary China article you did, which I think you were just referring to, which is how hawkish is, is, Chinese, is the Chinese public which did some interesting surveys to, to tease this out. But these sorts of, um, this level of granular understanding, again, imperfect, but nonetheless, uh, this level of granular understanding is going to become incredibly important moving forward. So it gets me to my next kind of question I wanted to ask you about, which is to I think, take some of the preceding baseline observations, including on the really interesting thing of, in some ways, a more... Um, uh, tolerantly hawkish younger uh, generation in China and now map these on top of what we're seeing now with deteriorating U.S.-China um, relations. My, my first question is, um, what influences or shapes Chinese, Chinese nationalist attitudes? And I think specifically, I'm curious, is there any sort of feedback loop between um, statements or actions by the United States and, uh, and nationalist sentiment in China. It certainly seems the opposite way there is, right? So 
um, while you're seeing some element of public opinion being shaped by domestic mediators like politicians in the media, the U.S. public has, has increasing awareness of China, whether through the NBA controversy or now from corona, of the coronavirus, um, we seem to be reacting to uh, uh, actions China is taking. It seems like China's public opinion is reacting to actions we're taking, and so we seem to be caught in this loop. But I wanted to see if that maps onto your own understanding and, and how we should think of that. I think that there is a lot of direct transmission between what is said abroad and what is heard in China. It's not all mediated through the Chinese propaganda apparatus and state controlled media. And in fact, oftentimes the sort of the initial seed or germ of a nationalist outburst in China is genuinely coming from, you know, netizens who are online jumping the great firewall, you know, fighting on, on Twitter and other, uh, you know, platforms that are banned inside China. Um, and some of this, you know, then the, the government needs to decide whether or not it allows them a longer or shorter leash uh, and, and ultimately shutting down when they feel like it or on their hand, on, you know, the opposite, giving it a big megaphone. Um, and so there is, I, I think, this tendency for what is said abroad to um, potentially provoke a response inside China. And then the question then becomes, you know, how is it that the government in China decides to manage it? And, and I think there, there's a, they have a lot of leeway. Um, but I think one of the findings from the, the study that you just referenced is that Chinese uh, support for the government, I think, is increasingly contingent on what the government in China does or says. Um, and it's no longer this reflexive, I support China no matter what. Uh, instead, it's a greater, uh, you know, heightened expectations of the Chinese Communist Party to, to deliver mm. uh, for the Chinese people. And then the question becomes, you know, what, what counts? You know, what is it that the Chinese public wants uh, the government to deliver? And there, the government has, I think, a couple of options. They have both, uh, you know, rhetoric, which I've written about taking the form of bluster, tough talk, not necessarily backed up by tough action. But they also, bluster can also take the form of, you know, posturing for global leadership, you know, these sort of symbolic efforts to, to lead the world, whether that's in combating the coronavirus uh, or creating a, you know, a shared future for humankind. I mean, these, uh, these slogans, these vapid slogans, nonetheless, I think, can help uh, demonstrate for a domestic public that China is, you know, claiming the kind of rightful leadership that the CCP has promised. So there, I think there are many different ways in which the, the rhetoric can, uh, you know, serve some, uh, you know, purpose in terms of uh, augmenting domestic support, even short of uh, China developing the capabilities to achieve all of its, uh, you know, kind of lofty ambitions. Something you've written about in a recent monkey cage uh, uh, piece was on, um, I think in reaction to uh, some recent work, including a, a longer piece by Min Xin Pei in, in Foreign Affairs on how really the coronavirus and, and, and the Beijing's early bungling of this in, in December and January had really led to a, a rise in frustration and anger as well as external pressure from the United States. These two things together were bringing, I think it was this upheaval domestically in China. And one of the things that you argued is um, that the poor performance, uh, to put it mildly, of the United States and other Western democracies in dealing with the coronavirus had given, if there was pressure building on Xi Jinping uh, domestically, it, it offered something of a reprieve. Um, I just wanted to ask you to unpack that. And I think I'm actually very curious to hear about your your heuristics or your thought process to, to getting to those types of conclusions. Because again, it seems to me that Xi Jinping's position in power in our popular discourse seems to swing very wild, wildly between sort of God King on the one hand, who's unassailable no matter what, and on the other, this, this figure who is, you know, every summer when we go into Beidaiho, we have this series of rumors and reports about, you know, the elders are about to take the old guy out. Um, and, and we haven't seemed to find a middle ground of this, of Xi Jinping as, as politician and, and leader who's dealing with various trade-offs. But um, it's a long way of saying, I, I just wanted to ask you to sort of think out loud about how you're looking at uh, external performances by democracies and, and how those might affect domestic um, nationalist sentiment. The reason I ask that is moving forward, 
um, understanding how, let's say, the behavior of the United States may or may not redound to or subtract from support for, for Xi Jinping domestically? <clears throat> That's a great question. So, I, you know, I see Xi Jinping as sort of presiding over a, a, some kind of steady and unsteady equilibrium of, you know, domestic constituents of various types at the elite as well as at the mass level. And the, the coronavirus came as a shock to this, uh, and the government scrambled to, uh, you know, shore up its you know, and restore its legitimacy uh, in terms of the out, kind of the fallout of the initial mishandling uh, of the outbreak. And then along comes the, you know, the, the struggles of countries around the world to, to grapple with the same virus, uh, you know, several weeks later. And there, I think that when, you know, somebody inside China who says, you know, I wish we had a different system. When they look outward and they think, well, what other systems might we, you know, move toward? There's always been, this has always been something that the Chinese Communist Party has used uh, as a defense against any kind of transition is the fear of chaos, right? That, that still looms, but then what's on the other side? Is it worth that kind of risk to get to this, you know, promised land, whatever vision of, uh, of you know, better governance? I think that it's, now harder and with the struggles of many other countries around the world, including liberal democracies like the United States, it's harder for uh, dissent in, dissenters in China to make the case uh, for something else. Um, because in addition to sustaining that kind of like disruption, what's what lies on the other side is it's a little less unclear. Mm. So that's maybe how I would get to that conclusion. We've got two minutes left. The, the, the final question I wanted to ask you, and we, we could go on for a very long time, but um, um, living in the United States, studying nationalism in China, but in this moment where we're seeing a big shift in public opinion here in the United States, uh, um, our own kind of populist nationalist moment, I'm curious, um, do you have any impressions or do you understand American nationalism any different from your studies of Chinese nationalism? I often find that I think differently about the United States and weaknesses and strengths, it, it, actually many times strengths the United States after spending a decade in, in China and looking at the, and looking at some of the institutional or governance arrangements there. I'm just curious if you had any, any thoughts about American nationalism with your China nationalist expert hat on. Yeah. You know, I see Chinese nationalism and American nationalism as both posing a hindrance to the respective government's efforts to lead internationally. And then in particular, the idea of America first um, makes it difficult for the United States to exercise principled leadership of a community of like-minded nations in grappling with the challenges posed by China's rise. And so um, I think American ideas and, and kind of imagination have shifted, I think, uh, over the last several years to one that is much more you know, parochial and much more exclusive, um, much more jingoistic, frankly, uh, which is, which, you know, that, that strand has always existed in the United States, but it had not been uh, quite so predominant. Uh, and so I think there's a, a real concern that, um, you know, we are headed into a, a world uh, that, you know, is characterized by less principled leadership by either the United States or China. Of course, it all depends on the outcome of the November election here in the United States. I think there, so if anything, I guess I would say that nationalism in any country is contested uh, and that the ideas which should sort of rise to the top um, outcompete the others in kind of seizing the, the political imagination of the country and, and motivating the, the country's leaders um, it really matters, um, but it, it's not a foregone conclusion of which variety, uh, you know, so will be the one on top. Mm. Um, I mean, and so in that sense, uh, you know, it's a, it's a call to citizens also, I think, to think hard about the kind of, um, kind of moral and intellectual vision they want to see kind of um, held up and um, waved high in the, the banner of nationalism. Like what, what are the, what's written on that banner, I think. Uh, matters not just for governance at home, but also how other countries uh, perceive uh, those countries. Mm. Uh, a, a great uh, high note to to end on, um, Jessica. Thank you very very much for for this. Um, again, I, I think anyone who's interested in this issue of Chinese nationalism.
there's some really fantastic work, academic work that is being done. I would highly, highly recommend um, Jessica's you know uh, recent paper on how hawkish is the Chinese public for not only some really, really interesting findings that will have an important impact on all of us, uh, but also as a way to understand on, on just how how some of this work is happening. And the idea, I think, that we need to remember that China China has politics too. Um, there is public opinion in China. Um, that a constricted public sphere does not mean the eradication of public sphere. And, and, and it's important, I think, especially over the next 6, 12, 18 months, as tensions get very high, that we do our best to understand the contours of debate and discussion, again, albeit very constricted. Um, but, but nonetheless, we, we have to make a really concerted effort to do that. And, and Jessica and many of her comrades in, in the China academic world, I think, are extraordinary allies for those of us who are trying to, to understand these big shifts. Um, so subscribe to your, your local academic journal, spend the $100 to, uh, to give Oxford U University Press or Cambridge more money that they will not redistribute to the academics, but nonetheless, it will help subsidize their, their work. Um, subscribe to the monkey cage. It's subscribe to the monkey cage in Washington Post, which, which I should say is precisely designed to help act as a transmission belt from academic research into, into the public discourse. Um, but Jessica, thank, thank you very much again for, for joining us and thanks to uh, all of you for watching. Thanks so much, Jude, it was a pleasure.